Welcome to the Cause and Brew Show! Yeah! Ooh, that was a good late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. I don't know what song yeah. you were singing there, but I think I've heard it. I heard I it know. in the late 80s, early 90s. Is that a sign that you're getting old when, like, you are humming or singing a song, but you have no idea what it, um, where it's from or what it's called? Yeah, 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 yeah. Was that it? Does that just mean... It was close. It was close, but I still don't know what it's from. It didn't help. I don't know either, but I believe it was from the late 80s, early 90s, when all great music was made. Hammer pants were in, in vogue. Um... <laughs> I, I I would peg my pants or attempt to, but like all good fashion yeah, trends, yeah. I was probably like two or three years late on that, and everybody had moved on. But how you doing, yeah. buddy? You, you feeling okay? Yeah, I've been better. I've been better. I'm a little slow. I'm a little slow. In the holiday, people don't like to talk about in the holiday season. Um, they don't. They don't. They talk about the and dealing with family and all this and the travel. What they don't talk about is the ungodly amount of alcohol consumption that happens <laughs> during this time of the year. <laughs> no, one, no one wants to talk about that, but uh, I've fallen victim uh, to that the last few days, and uh, I'm not done uh, with the Christmas party circuit either. So um, I got I to gotta rev my – I got to get the engine ready. You know, the listeners yeah. may or may not know this after years of listening to us, but Kaz is probably you're 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 high up there in the Christmas party circuit rankings. Like you're <laughs> you're, you're, you're up there, probably what top ten, top twenty, at least in Petaluma. You're a top ten, <laughs> top twenty Christmas party circuit ranking guy. Because because you guys go do a lot, and you know what? Hey, more power to you. Because you know a lot of people complain about this time of year and. You know how much stuff they got to do, but you guys properly set aside time for what's important, <laughs> <laughs> and that is hitting the Christmas party circuit. You know what? That that's actually a great movie idea. You know, a la Wedding Crashers. That is good. I mean, it's just stupid enough <laughs> to work. Yes, that is a great one. Um, you know, and speaking of dumpster fires, heyo. Uh, this is the dumpster yeah. fire oh. episode of the Cos and Brew Show. We're going to talk about dumpster fires throughout the league and determine are they dumpster fires uh, just like right now or are they going to be dumpster fires all year? And this show, drum roll please, is brought to you by Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company, who I am so thankful for this morning on this Monday morning. I did not, I did not, uh, see, did I go to a Christmas party this weekend? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think that qualified as a Christmas party, but we did do Christmas stuff. We uh, went and we got a Christmas tree a couple weeks late, but got a Christmas tree, which means that you got to stop at a brewery, and then when you get home, you got to decorate the tree, which requires yeah. eggnog and some Irk and Jerk. And if you're not yeah, familiar yeah. with the Irk and Jerk is, that's brandy, really cheap brandy. Yes. yes. Well, you could go with the VSOP. I've seen that, but you know, I'm, I'm so partial to the Irk and Jerk that, like, is it good, bad? Is it, you know, like, what, what is that? It's just a little bit better. <laughs> All right, well. If you, I mean, like, you know, either way, you're good. I mean, but yeah, if you want, if you're just going old school, See, you go with the, just I, the I, standard I, E&J. I'm going to, is that a version of E&J you're talking about, or is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's their, oh. it's their, uh, their high-end one, yeah. So, oh, it's their uh, black it's a, label. It's a, Got it, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, All right, you know. no, that, that's good because, you know, I was just sitting here drinking this eggnog thinking this is some eggnog and really crappy brandy, so I, I needed to step up my game. So, no, the coffee's coming in. It's, it's great for a Monday morning. It's great for a Monday night. It's great basically whenever. And uh, we just started this uh, promotion – or uh, sponsorship with these guys in the last couple weeks, and it's been really phenomenal. They're a great family-owned company that has sent us tons of coffee, and they're just really supportive. They're kind of similar to Hoopball in that um, they're known around the league, but they want to get up to that next level. So uh, they're helping us. We're helping them. And uh, if you are into things like uh, fantasy sports, DFS, we're running contests and promotions with these guys, so you can win some coffee. So check out... Uh, Hoopball Tweets and Hoopball Fantasy for more information about that. Uh, Cause, 
you might be getting some coffee in the mail. Woo! I needed it today. I had to stop at Starbucks, but I, I definitely, I definitely needed it today. <laughs> no more Starbucks for you, sir. It's just Hawaiian right. Isles kind of coffee from here on out. Um, dumpster yeah, fire stuff, man. There's going to be a dumpster fire pretty soon in Steph Curry's neck of the woods, and and cause you know was just getting back to earth from his Christmas parties this week, so it would make sense that he would not know that Steph Curry said that we did not make it to the moon, that that, in fact, was a farce. Your thoughts, sir, on Stephen Curry's what? comments about not making it to the moon. Or do you believe this? Or do you believe that Steph oh, Curry could say this? Oh, I thought that you were, I thought he, he was saying it like some sort of a metaphor to like, they haven't started to play well yet or something. You're talking about he doesn't believe in the moon landing. That is absolutely correct. That's according to uh, oh. a recent podcast that he did with all sorts of people out of Atlanta. Uh, it was Kent Bazemore and Vince Carter and somebody else uh, that I don't know from the team. And they had Steph on, uh, and he made these comments in the podcast. So uh, yeah. the folks over at My Old Stomping Crowns at uh, NBC Pro Basketball Talk had the transcript. So go check out at Basketball Talk on Twitter. If you want to get the breakdown on what that story is, surely this is going to come up because it's Steph Curry. And we just went through this with Kyrie Irving for like six months, maybe 12. (laughs) And eventually Kyrie relented and gave in. Um, There were a lot of teachers in like elementary school that were mad at (laughs) Kyrie Irving. (laughs) Right, right. Of the extra work, I presume, that he was causing these poor teachers who were underpaid and underappreciated have one more thing to explain to the kids. Um, so, like, w- w- Steph is a man of faith, and I'm trying to figure out how that might play into this, but, like, do you yeah. think he really doesn't believe in the moon landing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard some people pretty passionately uh, discuss that. Um who was it? You know, they get shot down on Twitter like instantaneously. Like, you know, like th- th- these people I, are I, like buffoons. You know, Kyrie's, yeah, Kyrie's I, a buffoon because he believes this. And Steph is yeah. a buffoon if he believes this. And, right, right. you know, the, the idea that hundreds and I guess hundreds or thousands of people could keep something like that a secret is, you know, like a point zero 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 one percent chance. Right, right. <laughs> you think, you think, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, are, I don't are, know much that, that one. I, I mean, the funny, the thing about all these things, like it's flat Earth and uh, you know the moon landing and those kind of things, like when you, if you watch something that the people that they put together, you know, it's they do a very good job. So, like, if you watch one of those like flat Earth like videos or something. At the end of it, you're like, wow, you know, that's, that's interesting. You know, they're, they're, so <laughs> if you don't like, <laughs> if you don't, if it's not something that you're going to really investigate, you know, I'm, I'm sure whatever he saw, um, I'm sure whatever he saw, he, you know, watched and I'm sure he didn't get the other side. And I, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, now I'm just putting his mouth. I have no idea. I don't know. You are like know. a lot of know. other I... people right now probably trying to figure this out. Like, how does Steph Curry, who seems to be pretty much with it on most things, right? how would he come to that conclusion of that that was staged? I mean, I know a lot of people probably think about it. That's a, that's a, more, that's a bigger... Um, that one I hear a lot more than a flat earth one. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Chili Peppers had a lyric in their one of their songs, you know. Uh-huh. So, I mean, not that that was that maybe that could be the only pop culture reference that that I've seen of it, but it's definitely a more mainstream idea mm-hmm. than uh, flat Earth, right? I mean, flat Earth. If you're gonna have a weird idea, I'd rather be the flat Earth guy than the moon landing didn't happen guy, because at least that one's weird. What? <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, because if we had a flat Earth, you would just fall off the side of it. I mean, it makes no sense at all. It, to me, is absolutely hilarious. It means we're in one of those sci-fi movies where, like, 
It, <laughs> what was that? There was, oh, I'll never remember the name of it. Like a, a sci fi movie where the, the earth is flat and then like the oceans just sort of spill over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, what are odds wise? What are we talking here? Is is Steph gonna like apologize and say no, well, he didn't man, mean no it, way. or is he gonna say he was no. joking? Is what? What's he no. gonna do here? Is he gonna go all in? He's got to go all in. If I was Steph Curry, I would look up the top what fifty conspiracy theories, and I would like say a different one every week. Like next week, I expect him to say how. Uh, Talk about how Ted Cruz's dad killed JFK. <laughs> <laughs> Who put that one out there? Is that a Trump thing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, goodness. Um, I just, it was a w- w- wild thing to flash across the screen on a Monday morning. I mean, it, it's been calm, I think, for about six months where you wake up and you're not expecting craziness on your Twitter. That one, though, that was a good fun little bit of craziness and uh i i don't i kind of think he will oh, man i hope he doesn't though i hope he doesn't back it up because then we're gonna have to talk about this for a really long time and, and i don't want that for the school teachers across the united states i just don't want that because that, that that one's too rough um <laughs> Dumpster fires. I was I was going to tell you this story about my wife, but no, we'll, we'll go right into the dumpster. We got a lot of ground to cover here. There's a lot of dumpster fires in the NBA right now, and and it's pretty weird. Like, I don't think anybody expected like the Rockets and the Jazz to be this bad. I mean, they were like two, three right. in the the West contention rankings, and they've been pretty bad. And then you got these like raging dumpster fires. In Chicago is the, the, the most recent one, and it's also the funnest one. We'll jump right into that in a second here. The Suns are terrible, like really bad. And, and of course, yeah. the Wizards. Um, it was funny. The Kings didn't even really make this list, and I thought to myself, well, there is some dumpster fire stuff going on there, but even their dumpster fire stuff isn't like frontline news anymore. It's the rest of the league. I don't think you can call them. A, they're not a dumpster fire right now. I mean, they're a game over five hundred. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, it, it, absolutely right. In, in fairness to the Kings, they're they're a game over five hundred. They're playing pretty well now. They have caught a soft spot in the schedule here, which they've gone into Cleveland, um, you know, and, and won a game. They're going to get Chicago, I think, tonight. Um, Chicago reeling right now after firing coach Fred Hoiberg and I don't even know where to I like when that hit the net I couldn't even muster a reaction to it it <laughs> it's like one of the, the dumbest two to three years in um sports really because that I mean it just like didn't accomplish a single thing whatsoever um Hoiberg or the team? Both. I mean, and and you, somebody broke it. I forget who did, like kind of did a little history of what they've been through and how they've done it. But like bringing in Dwayne Wade and Rajon Rondo in the middle of this guy's tenure when he's a pace and space guy is just yeah. Like, what are you guys doing? And um, you know, the Bulls have been lucky. There have been teams like the Kings and the Knicks in the past <laughs> three to four to five <laughs> years. To take the pressure off of them. Right, right. (laughs) Um, You know, it did well to get Wendell Carter in the draft. So you'd think things were looking up. I mean, getting Laurie Markin in and Chris Dunn via trade, you you, you kind of like, and and Zach Levine, you really had kind of some good, you know, good foundation there for a good uh, future, but they didn't think so. They wanted to get rid of Hoiberg, who they worked their asses off to get in there. And, um, Now they've got Jim Boylan, who's like <sighs> Jim. Where Boy- was he before? He had he's had a she's had a shot before, right? You know, there's like, two Jim Boylans. Um, I, there's Jim Boylan, which is the current <laughs> coach of the Bulls, and then there's Jim Boylan, <laughs> and Stat Boy is sending me Ghost of Stat Boy is sending me. Uh, actually, I don't know which one's which. I, they might be the same guy. I'm pretty sure there's two of them. <laughs> Assistant coach rankings are not my strength. This is my- <laughs> but what Stat Boy sent me, there's just like 
now I really now I really want to know the difference between Jim Boylan and Jim Boylan. Jim Boylan. There are two. There are I two. Wish, I wish I was a, a Chicago media person so I could go to the game and I would be, I would every time I, I would uh, <laughs> address him like Coach Boylan, uh, can you talk to us about the game? Boylan, I was practicing. <laughs> He's um it, okay. The coach is Jim Boylan. Len Len is uh the the new coach, and he's something out of like the fifties. If you were to just like look at his picture, and he's foaming at the mouth, and what he's done <laughs> in Chicago is really phenomenal. Like he's talking a lot, and a lot of young coaches do that too. They like talk to the media constantly. And so things get out there and, you know, quotes get made and things sound funny. Um, the, the most recent, I think, aside from the firing, um, which we don't know a ton about, I should say, you know, of Fred Hoiberg, like uh-huh. it, it was so oddly timed that you kind of wonder if a player or two said, you know, we don't want to play for this guy. Which is kind of yeah. like the go-to move for players now. Like you know, you, if you were a young player and you, um, you you got called up the ranks in high school, like if you played varsity as a freshman or something like that, you know, you kind of had yeah. this like you know cool guy feel uh, about you. And if you got to take games off or practices off because you were better than everybody else, you kind of got this cool guy feel going. And this this it seems like players now that haven't quite made it into superstardom almost want to have that chip on their shoulders where if they, things aren't going right for whatever reason, they just start casting blame and, and you're seeing right. it actually in Phoenix and you're seeing it in Chicago right now. It's funny how it's all sort of circling around. Cause let me get to the, the meat of the story here. The, the bulls lost by like 50 the other day. And it was a franchise record or close. And what Boylan yeah, did, it was. It, it, okay, it was a franchise record. What Boylan did was he did a five man sub early in the game, which is, I don't know, I guess it's a little bit much, you know. And I get that. You're showing up all of your veterans, not that the Bulls have all these veterans, but whatever. You're showing up all your veterans and you're bringing in the kids. They weren't quite upset over that one. He did it a second time in the second half <laughs> within three minutes. <laughs> and the, and the, the Celtics had only gone on a 5-3 run. So clearly there was something he didn't like. And this became a pissing match. You know, Somebody didn't run back hard and oh. boom, all five of you were gone. And so they were pissed. And yeah. um, he also questioned them in the media and these guys basically, um, after being called into practice on the, the day following a back-to-back, which is very rare, most times NBA players get those days off, they were ready to boycott. They, they had a text message string. Um, they were talking about boycotting the practice. Uh, vets like Robin Lopez chirped in and said, hey, guys, let's not do that. And um, citing professionalism and then the younger guys on the roster that might be at risk, you know, for doing something like that or the, the lesser players on the roster, I should say. Uh. And eventually they decided that they would go in and demand a players meeting followed by a coaches meeting. And there was all sorts of tit for tat in the media like they weren't going to practice no matter what. And then Jim right. Boylan went to the media and said that it was his idea that they that they weren't going to practice and that he called them in so they could build trust. Like he, he wasn't going to tell them that they weren't practicing, but like when they showed up, he was going to be like, Hey guys, we're only watching film today. You should trust me. See, see, I know what's right. I'm Jim Boylan. Boylan. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, oh, I mean, like, and, there, and the funny part now is, like, we're getting postmortems of the incident, and now players are being ruled out by Casey Johnson, the beat reporter for the Chicago Tribune, who some say is a little team-friendly, and he's been around enough to be considered a pro, so, you know, go with what you feel like there. But um, they've ruled out uh, Robin Lopez. They've ruled out um, Wendell Carter and Laurie Markinen 
as the ringleaders, they've, they've, they've narrowed it down to two to three people who are really pushing the, the sit out of practice agenda. Uh-huh. And everybody else was sort of telling them, no, we shouldn't do that. And they're circling around and they're saying, this guy wasn't a part of it. This guy wasn't a part of it. And you got to wonder if it's Zach Levine and Jabari Parker. These are the two that, uh-huh. that, that kind of feel like the most gripey of the bunch. And yeah, and I also I could also see it um, as far as Levine goes. I could totally see him being like, "Listen, if this guy thinks if this guy thinks I'm going to be dealing with Thibodeau too, he's out of his mind." You know, <laughs> all this nonsense. He's like, "No, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm to end this right now." <laughs> so definitely Jabari. I don't know. I don't know much about Jabari. He's um, well, if he's uh, already he, butted heads with. Hoiberg over playing time and yeah, J- Jabari what, what Jabari player is different in his mind than what it is on film I'll just leave it at that um, so I don't really you know it wouldn't shock me I mean as going to what you said about the lesser players in the league you know right? and I don't understand what the end game is like were they going to fire this guy too you know like and and what does that mean? Like, okay, if, if they do, okay, they're not going to bring him back next year. You know, what, what is that? Oh, well, now I can, now I can thrive because, uh, you know, I, I know I, I don't run, I don't play hard. Um, I'm hurt all the time. But now that this coach is gone, now I'll be able to, to become the player that I, that I should be. I mean, I don't know. It was weird. Well, and and it, to be completely clear about this, Zach Levine's been – the most frustrated player about all of this and the players have been talking to the media just as much as boy Len has been talking to them as well. Like he, sorry, that's going to be his name. Um, like, so, I mean, it's definitely Levine. He's definitely one of the pissed off guys. Um, and I mean, there's just so much guh here. It's like hard to figure out what this team should do. Um, I mean, boy Lynn is, basically there for the, this year, I think. I don't think he's going anywhere. And I wonder, you know, are the Bulls fine with him getting in there and torching this thing because they're tanking and, you know, he can be the bad guy. And, you know, if he gets in there and roughs these guys up, you know, a little bit, then maybe they think that that's good for these players. Um, but but well, yeah, you know, there's, I, nothing, I there, the- there's nothing good that's going to happen, though, as a result of any of this. Right, right. So they they've just been, their, their decision making is just I mean I you know I wasn't a big fan of the Hoiberg hire I think that you know in watching the first half of you know, that season he I, I think he's a college guy you know I think even though he played and stuff uh, he's a college guy I don't think that he was there never seemed to be a you know, he said he was going to be pace in space, and but you know they never played a lick of defense under him, and they they never even the pace in space thing didn't seem like they were truly committed to that. Even before you know they brought in Rajon and Wade, you know, but um, well, it's, it's yeah, I, I, the Bulls are I mean, they're just a you know they're a dumpster fire. Yeah, they're a dumpster <laughs> fire, and it, it doesn't <laughs> seem like they're going to be getting any better anytime soon, and. The, the, the crazy thing is they have a cache of assets here. You know, like, yeah. the, the, this isn't something you just kind of, like, summarily dismiss and say, hey, let's tank it away and, you oh, know. Oh, no, no, no. But that's kind of where they're heading. Um, it's so much funny here. Like, he referenced that Greg Popovich is a big five-man substitution guy, and I completely, like, <laughs> spit – Whatever I was drinking out of my nose, like, come on, man, you cannot be comparing yourself to Greg Popovich in your third day. <laughs> like, anytime anyone says that, like, as a justification for their actions, it's like, you know, oh well, you know, this is how. Why, why are you uh, making a? Why are you making a grilled cheese and turnip sandwich? Oh, well, you know, this is what Gordon Ramsay does. You know, it's like, no, no, you know. <laughs> Start with the PBNJ and work yourself up from there. He's um, so he's he's getting in there and he's just like and he's unabashed about the fact that he's trying to disrupt. He called it shock and awe, and I thought, well, <laughs> well that was an excellent George Bush reference. I mean, way to go there. Um, 
the but the you got these players coming back. You got Chris Dunn and Bobby Portis coming back. Laurie Markkinen just came back. Wendell Carter's been playing great, and you have a player really in Zach Levine who both him and Jabari Parker make this offense unwatchable. Um, I watched a game two to three weeks ago where it was the fourth quarter, and there were like two passes. You know, from aside from like primary action getting set up and really slowly moving the offense into place, like the first player that got the ball was like, I'm not getting rid of this. I'll never get it back. And they just made their move and went. And I mean, no joke, fourth quarter, like two passes off of a whatever your initial primary move was. And um, those two guys are really they're they're tough right now. Like Levine is trying to establish that he's the the alpha on this team. And I think it's – you're seeing this in Phoenix, too, with Devin Booker. I'll talk about them in a second. Uh, I'll just give a quick aside. But, like, Devin Booker was chewing out DeAndre Ayton left and right in a game visibly on the court. It's like, dude, can you buy beer yet? Like, <laughs> why are you all over me? And you got a laundry list of things that you do that I'm not chewing you out for. And right. same, I think, goes with Levine trying to take this team underneath his wing. Is he really hasn't earned it yet? And Jabari yeah. Parker's what, out there what, trying what, to, what? right? And Jabari Parker's out there, probably not with this team next year. Got a big old deal, and he's really not going to play much because he can't defend the three, and he's not as good as the other guys to play the four or the five. So. Um, they're just at odds with each other right now. And if you're the Bulls, <clears throat> what do you do? I mean, you, taking into account that you're a dumpster fire, that you're the Bulls, you can't get out of your own way, what do you do next? Like, you can't, in my opinion, I, I think Zach Levine actually alluded to the fact that he said, well, we'll have to see what happens on Monday. Almost as if there was like an automatic understanding that he personally was going to roll over and that all of his teammates would roll over. It'd be another fifty-point loss until the team did something. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think it, it's it, the the weird thing too is it's so early in the season still, and you, you know, hey, how many coaches can you fire in one season? <laughs> you know, um, I'm not sure. Um, the problem with when a team that's playing this bad is now, you know, it, it, when you look at the roster, you're like, got a lot of young talent, you know. But when when you put, like, this kind of crap on film, you're, the assets become, they don't mean as much, you know. People can start picking them apart as you thought, like, oh, you know, uh, whoever, Portis can do this, that, and the other. I mean, he's not playing right now, but he can do this, that, and the other. But then you have this, you know, 10, 15 game stretch where he's walking or loping up and down the court. Now he's not the asset that he once was. Um, I think they're just going to have to limp through the year. I probably would just keep everything intact unless you get some, some offers for someone that, um, you know, kind of the fr uh, fringe rotation guy. Um, but I would keep it all together. And then it's really about next, next season, bringing in a established coach, um, a very well respected, and um, you know, paying paying the piper and, and turning the thing over. You, you need to bring in someone that's almost that you'd be willing to like. You know, if if, if Levine and Jabari Parker are acting up, it's going to be completely obvious. There's not going to be a question of this person's ability to coach or you know have players respect them. Like if they start acting up with the next guy, it has to be a, a, a coach that is kind of impeachable. So um, that's where I would go. But there's not, I don't think there's really much they can do this year. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting point about keeping it together that you said. I mean, so that means Boy Len is going to be there with the, the old school, um, heavy handed deal. And I mean, it could get very, uh, there could be a lot of fireworks here. It's, it's going to be just really fascinating to watch. And, Will this team go into a full rollover position? Um, we I saw it in Sacramento when uh, they fired Michael Malone. The the, the, the team was not going to play, and you right. kind of think that it could possibly go away. But 
it didn't, and it wasn't going to, and eventually the ownership caved. Now, the, the situation over in Chicago is different. you got Jerry Reinsdorf, who's been into, you know, has gotten into it with everybody, and Garpax, yeah. you know, the the head of yeah. operations yeah. and, you know, everything over there, they're kind of Teflon, so that's... um. It's a different situation than it was in Sacramento, which was a total dumpster fire back then. Um, so they're going to keep going at it. And is there anything to what Jim Boylan is doing here? Like, you know, you've talked about in at much lower level in high school having a player revolt type situation. Like, yeah. is there something to be said for putting your foot down and, and just going from balls out, really? <laughs> You're just like, I, I don't there- have a chance here, so I'm going to do it my way and, and screw you all. Yeah, well, there is, I think, but you have to be honest. Like, you have to, I don't know what he's, you know, if you're not explaining what's going to happen, like that, that it shouldn't be a shock. Like, you, you need to explain, because basically what, like, in an NBA game, guys are, thrive the best when they have a role. They know their minutes. Because, you know, these guys are amazing. They can do amazing things. And just because they're 0 for 5 doesn't mean that, you know, there's not going to be a 40-point game coming, you know. So, but, but that is when they're, but you have to, so you have to give them their time. Now, if, if you're saying that, Hey, you guys are not being professional. This is, this is not a professional team. This is not the way pros act. And so I'm going to have to treat you as such. That's something that needs to be said and established. And, you know, they, that they have to agree. If they, if they want to say like, Oh no, we, we, we deserve to, uh, we deserve to, do what we want and and not play defense and and throw the ball all over the court and uh, not pass and, and and they then then you have to go with the heavy hand but to just all of a sudden you know <laughs> just I mean that's the kind of thing like that like Coach K does like a couple of guys aren't playing hard and so he just goes to the bench and points at everybody he's like get them all out of here get them all out of there you know I mean it's just not really something that you do in the NBA. Yeah, yeah, to um, quote, to quote the, the great Ben Affleck in the amazing movie Boiler Room, a sale is made on every call. You either sell them or they sell you. And that, to me, feels like where this is at for, like, every coach. You know, you can tell these guys, hey, you're not getting it done. But if you can't sell them on it, then it's all bets are off. And it's also funny that this was apparently last done or maybe – it's probably been done a few times. I mean, hell, Greg Popovich does it all the time. So what? What do we know? Um, the the <laughs> Bulls did it with Tim Floyd, and um, when Charles Oakley was on the team. So uh-huh. Tim Floyd, you know, this was when the college coaches were first sort of making their 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 move onto the NBA coaching scene. And yeah, uh, yeah Oakley was not a fan of that. But then Floyd basically told him to shut up, and those uh-huh. guys probably fought, and we don't know about it. But um, situation of uh, a guy that came in and he's like, I'm going to blow it up and he's done blown it, blown it up. Okay, so uh, moving on, we have Rockets and Jazz. These are medium dumpster fires. You know, they're not long-term dumpster fires. Uh, maybe, who knows, maybe Houston could um, it start to implode, but Houston is starting to get not blown out. I mean, they did get blown out in, in uh, two games ago, but they're starting to look a little bit like we don't care. And and I, they got really called out to the carpet by Rachel Nichols, which I thought was pretty funny. Like She's the best. Yeah, yeah. And then when she gets focused, she can really laser in and, and make you feel bad if you're a, a Houston yeah. Rocket. Um, they just sort of don't look like they got a lot of heart. Eric Gordon's being – not vocal, but he seems to be the team spokesman right now saying, look, we're not getting the guys the ball in the right places. Who knows? That could mean he's not getting the ball in the right places. <laughs> um, there's not, doesn't seem to be a usage issue here. I mean, you got really, you know, they've thinned out, you know, no Trevor Ariza. Carmel Anthony was a flop as expected. And <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> How is it that every single person on the planet understood that it was going to be a horrible decision, <laughs> except for the Houston Rockets? Well, I just, like what? I don't know. I don't get well, it. Well, and it kind of goes to this like 
the game behind the game that people don't have a great feel for, even reporters, I mean, the top of the top reporters can tick and tie everything that's going on. But really, nobody has the clue of like how that happens. You know, why does Carmelo <laughs> Anthony happen? And you got a player in Chris Paul who's friends with him. And, you know, how much does that influence, you know, pan out? And if you noticed, you know, it wasn't like James Harden was going to bat for Carmelo Anthony. Right. right. <laughs> And, and James Harden had a lot of like, don't ask me answers. <laughs> and and when stuff went down, you know, like basically anytime anything's gone down in Houston where there's a question about, you know, who might be behind what, it always seems like James Harden is just sitting there, like kind of like quietly <laughs> looking at you. Like it couldn't be me, right? And see, it's a, they're having their internal stuff. And how does this play out long term because this is a team that should have beaten the warriors like legitimately shouldn't have beat the or should have beat the warriors and they couldn't pull it off um they came close and they're basically a trevor Ariza away from being that team um what's changed is the question i i think there's uh i have some ideas but like i mean really it's the same damn team and trevor Ariza doesn't look that great right now so, I mean, it's not like yeah. he was an amazing piece. Um, yeah. you, know, you could almost I, argue that James Ennis is similar enough to where there shouldn't be this kind of a decline. Sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I think that in general, and, you know, this one's really bad because of the money that they've invested in Chris Paul, which is most likely going to be really, really bad money really, really soon. Um. This kind of, to me, this is kind of a thing in, that happens when your best player just doesn't really give a damn about <laughs> about one side of the ball. So when things go bad and you turn to your leader and you see that they're hustling around and diving and doing the little things and you just lose a game because you didn't make shots, you can get through a bad two or three game stretch like that. But when you're having a two or three game stretch where you're not, you're not moving the ball, you're not doing anything right, and you're not putting out effort, and then and you look to your leader and he's really not putting out any effort, it's very easy for everybody else, even the guys that are only there for effort, to, to not do it. And so, like everyone lo- says, like you know, when when things are going well for James Harden. And the team's playing well. Everyone says, "Yeah, yeah, he's great." But then when 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 they when they don't, people don't want to talk about that that stuff anymore. Like you can't you can't have it both ways. You can't be an MVP one game on one side and then not be an MVP on the other side. So to me, this is just the thing that ha- happens when your leader just doesn't care about defense. <laughs> And it also, I, mean, I, I was looking at those standings and I was like, man, you know, they're 25 games in. We're still so early in the season. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think either of those those guys, Chris Hart or Chris, um, Chris Paul or James Hart, I don't think they care at all what's going on right now. Um, they should, you know, and maybe that there's a bigger picture. They think they can't compete with the Warriors. So why care about the regular season? You know, like if you're, yeah. you know, if you, if it's going to come down to, are you at your best in the playoffs? Why exert all this early season energy, you know, before you get there, that might be a little bit of it. But I also think that like, um, Clint Capella, he's, he's getting his due this year. Everybody's praising him. And mm-hmm. I mean, we had him ranked highly in fantasy and we had him ranked highly last year in fantasy. And so everybody's, you know, we're all cheering everything he does, you know, from a statistical perspective, but he looks to me like he's a tiny bit slower. I think that big men <laughs> peak out in their second and third years in terms of athleticism. Um, when you switch and they've had some, some, you know, back and forth with the scheme, trying to figure out if switching is still for them. Um, yeah. But Across the board, including Clint Capella, I feel like everybody's foot speed is down. So, on top of your the issues that you you presented, 
if your big man can't switch, you know, or he can't switch as effectively, it's a problem. You know, you're going to yeah. have, um, you're just going to have more erosion on defense, which means you pull the ball out more, which is fine for them. They're not trying to run the ball up and down the court, but, um, you know, it's sort of a col- this and, and a lot like the Jazz. It's a cumulative effect when Rudy Gobert isn't this sort of like amazing, tall, can get vertical, you know, can get lateral. Do when when Rudy Gobert came on the scene, but we were in summer league. We saw him at summer league for the first time. He was like, like kind of like guard quick, but in a seven yeah, foot yeah. package, and. um you know that's not happening for the Rockets. They're eleven and fourteen. Um, defensively, they got to get better. Defensively, they got to get better. Offensively, they're still pretty good. Defensively, they got to get better. And so let's let's move into the Jazz here. What Utah? I mean, I I I personally have no problem pinning this a little bit on Rudy Gobert's lack of defensive just amazingness now his stats are really good this year he's been really good um you know on the glass he's blocked shots the to me though it's it's just like with houston like ricky ricky rubio really slow now like really slow and <laughs> donovan mitchell is his, his he's his own deal on offense but you know, at least he gives you some athleticism there uh, defensively. But like Jay Crowder, he's really slow now. Derek Favors, he's really slow. Um, Joe Ingles, for everything that he's really, really good at and, and really elite defensively, he's not adding to the quickness, you know, part of the <laughs> equation. So to me, they're just really slow. And, you know, offensively, they can't – you know, they don't have a reliable playmaker outside of Ingles and Donovan Mitchell that can, like, sort of get their own shots. And Ingles is, you know, still one of those guys that can pump fake you to death and, you know, get off a high percentage it, shot. But he's not really yeah. breaking you down in isolation or anything like that. Yeah, his his being able to get shots off, a lot of, a lot of that depends on um... – you know, the defensive matchup and stuff too, that, you know, whoever's guarding him. Um, I think offensively, yeah, I, I agree um, defensively. But I think offensively they have, I mean, Mitchell's just playing bad. I mean, like he, he's got to stop chucking the way he's chucking right now. Um, he, I think he's only getting in a line like three times a game. You know, something like that. Maybe, maybe four. Maybe shooting four free throws. That's unacceptable for someone that can get to the rim like that. He needs to be getting to the line at least. You know, he should be shooting, especially as their struggle. He should be shooting. He should be getting to the line eight times a game during these stretches. You know, and I think that this he's kind of falling victim to, you know, the 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 stat. At, you know, stat sheets and you know, through, uh, long twos are bad and all that. Like he, he is clearly not shooting the ball well. And I mean, like it's one thing when when Clay Thompson goes over eight behind the three point line because you know it could it could turn around really really quickly. Mitchell isn't that good of a shooter, and so he needs to when when they're desperate for a bucket, it can't be oh let me shoot my seven three today. He has to be, let me go at least get to the line. So I think that, you know, and, and, and like you said, they don't have a lot of playmakers, so their their margins are ra- razor thin. And he's the guy who has to be able, when other team is on a run, when they're struggling, he's the guy that has to at least slow the momentum down by getting to the line. And so that, that to me, is, is their, offensively their big problem. A couple things stand out when you look at their team stats. They're 27th in the league in turnovers. So when I think that, you either got somebody that's completely out of control, just doing crazy stuff on their own, or what's probably more accurate is when you have no options because you've lost all of your options throughout the course of the shot clock, you then start to do risky things. And um, that, you know, not having playmakers is, is why. You know, they've got that turnover number so high. Only 22nd in offensive rebounding, which is surprising considering they play two 
traditional bigs that should be yeah. able to beat other teams up on the glass. And and that's speaking a little bit to the quickness issues, um, you know, with those two um, being big and tall, you know, you got to have some quickness as well. Defensively, th- they are forcing turnovers. They are um, defensively rebounding the basketball. They're, they're good at the foul line, um, but they're, Effective field goal percentage is not great defensively. And when you look closer into the numbers, they're giving up a lot of threes. And that, to me, speaks to them giving up penetration, um, but then also not being able to recover. And it, it makes me wonder kind of like, well, where does that problem come from? Their, their regular field goal percentage defense is not great either. So teams are just scoring on them. And and you look at Rudy Gobert's defensive rating and it's pretty good. You know, he's he's the best on the team. So it's really hard to point the finger at Rudy, but I do think there's something to the fact that when he was extremely special that it siphoned off this area in the paint where where players knew this was his area and then mm-hmm. they could tighten down elsewhere. And that could that's like the only thing without you know, really getting down with like 16 hours of jazz film and really just trying to break it out. Um, that's that to me is where there's this dissonance of why are why is this team that's got continuity that is you know was good enough to push the Rockets last year and and a lot of people thought would win more than 50 games this year. What's going on with them and can they get out of it? Is the is the next operative question? Can they get out of it? Cause. I believe they can. I think they will. Um, I have more confidence in them than I do the Rockets. Um, now, they still both might make the playoffs. But as far as um, having, like, I still feel that the Jazz have a chance when their season's over to say that they had a positive season. Like, the Rockets have, whether they make the playoffs or not, the Rockets have no chance at saying that this was a good <laughs> I mean, that's... uh. That's all good and fine, I think, but the, the the Jazz, this was their year to really put on a uh, marketing piece for the rest of the league and try to add somebody in free agency that could look at what they were building and say, hey, I want to be a part of that. And it's a tough sell, you know, in Utah to get somebody yeah. there. And, you know, they would open up space with De- Derek Favors coming off the books, and you could really look at that 3-4 slot and try to get somebody in there that can, um, you know, move the needle. Um, Jay Crowder's not cutting it. Derek Favors isn't cutting it. And so you'd have to look at a big-time power forward to come in and push that team over the edge. And if they don't get the the wins up, if they sneak into the playoffs in the eighth slot, or maybe if they're even bottom four, you know, I think that's going to be tough. So it might be a little bit of a swing and a miss there. They risked a lot by keeping the band together. And, um, you know, gave up some money to Dante Exum, who hasn't really moved anything forward this year. And, um, you know, Favors comes off the books, so that's not as big of a deal. But, that, you know, it's rough. It's rough being out there in the West. The, uh, the only team that's not in the playoff hunt right now is the Phoenix Suns, so we move our dumpster fire coverage to them. What in the world <laughs> is Phoenix? They that they've been pretty disappointing. I thought that uh, that they were going to make some noise, not like necessarily with wins, but I thought that they had a chance to really, you know, have a fun brand of basketball. And I thought that they'd be a team that was going to be, you know, pushing a lot of teams. That maybe by the end of the season, it'd be they'd be a team that you didn't want to have to deal with if you were competing for a, you know seating and whatnot i thought that you know they'd be able to do some th- things i loved the addition of uh ariza and you Who know they're but, talking about trading now they're talking about trading right yeah, now yeah I mean, they're, they're an absolute mess i mean you watch uh deandre eight out there and the one thing that you know i i had him at number one but the one thing that did give give me pause was i wasn't sure about his motor well, not only does he not is, should have given me pause, he literally does not have a motor. Isn't that something, man? Like I, that dude, just, dude I, just walks around the court like I mean, he's just he, he you know my my, my five year old has started to play basketball, and there's definitely times where he is just standing there with his hand 
hands in his pockets thinking about it. And that is that is DeAndre Aiden. <laughs> he is just chilling out there. <laughs> and that's and well, and he contrasts with Rashawn Holmes and you know everybody knows about my backing of Rashawn Holmes and it's uh you know, from a fantasy perspective last year he you know, he was one of our big guys that never made it. And um so now he's out there just, you know, dunking and blocking shots with ferocity and running up and down the floor. And he's like the one antidote to the craziness of the Suns offense. Only the Suns could have Devin Booker run the franchise and take every shot. (laughs) But when Booker doesn't shoot, you've got TJ Warren out there who literally does not know what a pass is. Like that button on his controller just doesn't exist. And then if those two guys are hurt, You've got Jamal Crawford out there who can definitely do the job. And Josh Jackson is going to shoot or do something every time he gets the ball. And, I mean, it's just this collection of chuckers, even their guys that aren't chuckers like Ryan Anderson. The only reason you want him on the court is to shoot. So, like, (laughs) Trevor Ariza is out there. Like, Ariza, you know, Ariza just in the with the Rockets is like, here's the ball, James, go do your thing. He gets the ball now, and he's looking to drive every time, and he ain't beating anybody. And he gets done with his drive, and he's like, oh, crap, I got to pass the ball out. And, I mean, Aiton now sits into this, and when he gets the ball offensively, he's not passing. They got a guy in, in, in Mikhail Bridges who is like a perfect sort of do a little bit of everything glue guy he can't get the ball because he's not willing to go steal it from somebody. (laughs) And so like the antidote, you see little, like you you bring these young players in like Elliot Cobra, D'Anthony Melton, who are playing for jobs at the point guard position and they want to run pick and roll. And then you see a guy like Rashawn Holmes, who all he does out there is set screens and then roll to the hoop and clear open these really easy, either or decisions, either throw it to Rashawn or, his man tags and you've got a shooter open as these one pass shots. And um, it, it, to me, like you could really fix the Suns if you were to just trade Josh Jackson, you know, for anything, you know, just get him out of town Mm -hmm. because, because he can't, his, he's too impactful on a culture right now. And then you, you're going to trade Trevor Reza because why not sign a guy for 15 mil and then get rid of him halfway through the season? It, you know, it's classic sons. And you probably want to trade TJ Warren. You can't trade Te- Devin Booker. I don't think teams would be, you know, climbing all over themselves to get Devin Booker at that big of a deal. And so you got to build around Booker. I don't know. I think that, uh, I think there's such a toxic organization like I don't I think now if you were going to move on from him the time is now like cuz he I think can still be saved if if he goes to an organization that is an actual you know professional organization um now maybe by next year um it might be too late because I and mean, you can only you give a a, a 19 year old this kind of who really doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, I mean, he's not even like, um, you know, some guys are born old, you know, <laughs> like they are, some guys are a little more mature and kind of just get it. He's not one of those young people. And so for them to have acquiesced their entire organization to him, I mean, what the, the balloon in your head, it must be just incredible. So there, I don't, I don't see any possible way for them to have success with him as their best player. It's so I, Im- I would, impossible. I would, I, would, I, because of, because of what they've done, you know, uh, with him and what they've given him, I, that I don't, and I, I know they're not thinking this way, but as an outside observer, I don't see how they can not trade him. And I would trade him immediately, you know, and, and try and get, you know, as high. Cause I still think he's, you know, those, he puts up those games I and mean, he, he can play, you know, he's just not a very smart player. Well, so I think you can still get a lot for him right now. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, everybody made the Clay Thompson comparison with him coming into the league, and but that is exactly how you would want to use him, um, you know, off the ball. Let, right. him, let him be that secondary killer out there that, yeah. you know, is 
once he gets the ball, he knows it's his job to shoot. Right now, he takes about 10 really bad shots per game that are like morale crushing, just absolutely you should be benched the the minute that that thing leaves your hand type of shots. And he gets away with it because the, the sun sucks so bad without him that everybody goes, well, if he's not doing that, where would they be? Um, and it's just, right, right. you know, it's false equivalence and it's bad basketball. Um, the, the eight and stuff, it's, it's funny. The conversation that hit me on Twitter was basically like, so what do you do here? You got a player that's arguably playing better than, than Aiton and Holmes. Do you give him minutes? You know, what do you trade Aiton? And you know, these things, they become impossible to do or very hard to do in reality, but I would absolutely be okay trading DeAndre Ayton and letting Holmes be your center for the next two to three years. If I yeah. could get something back for Ayton that was like top 10, like a top 10 pick or better um, yeah. in that, that range of value. Cause I don't want people to find out two years from now that he is going to be a top 20 to 30 center and no much, not much better. You know, when when you factor in the defensive issues, because defensively, that's where I'm. I look at him and I go, he ain't getting much faster, folks. And he's getting steals and blocks right now, but they're not really a. Um, Airs. <laughs> yeah, Ghost, it, you know? it, they're just not an indicator of what's really going on out there. And right. same thing with Booker. If I could get something for Booker, because I'm not the franchise that can handle him, I would be all for that. But I think that the simple pragmatic moves that they can make is they can get rid of Josh Jackson. They can get rid of uh, Trevor Ariza and they can get rid of TJ Warren and use those pieces to reassemble. And um, yeah, you're going to suck, but you know, you got a guy in Mikhail Bridges who needs minutes that needs to be given the basketball. And with Holmes, I think, you know, you got to find a way to play him with Aiton or cut Aiton's minutes. And that's the dilemma. You start cutting Aiton's minutes. Now the rest of the league knows he's not good enough to play. Right. Your asset has been crushed. And and the last thing on the Suns before we quickly touch on the Wizards is this idea that Devin Booker should be, you know, leading this franchise as the number one guy. You know, it's this idea that the young player is able to handle that leadership role. And, you know, when he's chewing out DeAndre Ayton on the court, those guys are legitimately beefing right now, in my opinion. And yeah. I think that whole team is sick of each other because I would be sick of it. Like, I mean, the the amount of missed passes and, you know, with, with new coach Igor Kokoshkov out there, like, he's already showing signs that he can't handle it, which is probably unfair yeah. to him. Um, but you know, him and Mikhail Bridges are sort of getting into it and Bridges is so down on himself that he can't even look his coach in the eye right now. And this is all playing out in public. It, it's, it's not as ugly as Chicago and it's not as, you know, um, relevant yeah. as, as yeah. the Rockets and jazz, <laughs> but it's right. a mess. It's a mess. And I, I, I think, I think that, that, I think, that, I think, I think they can get as ugly as the Bulls pretty quick here. Well, you know, and I, I was I, wondering, you know, which team was worse between those two and then the Cavs. Um, the Cavs are making these, you know, they're making these teams are making the Cavs look normal right now. Right. <laughs> It'll be a three team race between these three teams. And then the Wizards. I mean, the Wizards, they amaze me on a daily Love basis. Right like, there. John Wall is going to take tonight's game off because of a heel injury. He said he shouldn't have played through it. I don't doubt that he has it. Um, uh. The knee is probably the bigger concern for me. He has no elevation right now, not compared to what he's known for. Right. Um, he's still trying to beat players like he's a number one, and it's just not as efficient. Um, teams aren't as afraid. There's the constant drama surrounding this team. Um, I, I, you can't move John Wall. So that's the, the biggest thing. I mean, con- yeah. His contract is insanely big. Um, you know, Otto Porter is the guy that's kind of the one you might, you might consider getting rid of. But, like, really, does that solve anything? 
you no, know, Washington just, Wizards. <laughs> you got rid of a player that can help you. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they were just a party to a trade that doesn't matter. I mean, they picked up Sam Decker in the deal. Maybe Scott Brooks will play him. Who knows? It's Scott Brooks. Um, you know, Dwight Howard's out for the next two to three months. They don't really have a big man behind him. Jan Mahimi is not going to be able to stand upright. And Thomas Bryant is really their only healthy body. Um, you know, we issued a pickup recommendation for him in fantasy. But, um, I mean, they're they're in the East. By virtue of being in the East, they could still make it to the playoffs. I mean, they're out of it <laughs> by a game right now. That is insanity. Um, <laughs> This to me of all of them feels like the dumpster fire that could rage on, you know, not just for like this season, but like two seasons. Oh no, they're a mess because you can't get rid of Wall, you know, like they're they're literally like there's no reason for anybody to go to a Washington Wizards game. <laughs> like there is no like they're not. I don't know what they're gonna do. I mean, I, I would I would assume. You know, you want to keep Bradley Beal, but he's the only one of any value. And you, the problem is, if you were, even if you were able to get like just great assets for for Bradley Beal, the problem is now that John Wall is the number is still the best player in your team. You know, and he is clearly not a franchise guy. You know, not only with his talent, not only with his with his skill set that as as eroding with his athleticism. But just as a as a character guy, he is not someone that can lead a franchise. So you're really so you really the one guy that you can get stuff for is is Beal, and you you can't move him because the best player is the character guy on your team. And this is a team with Austin Rivers and Dwight Howard on it. It's like a deep sigh anytime I talk about these guys. I, I but you know, I, I'm sitting here like you know we've been trying to fix these teams as we go here. We're not just like clapping on them. We want. Oh, by the way, the clapper's on sale. Um, it's all over TV wow. right now. Uh, you know who says that technology is ruining the world? Um, but like, <laughs> you know, we're trying to help these teams out. The only thing that I could think that the Wizards could do. I, I would seriously consider this like, and it's not going to happen because he's a piece right now in Memphis that is sort of important, and they're in the playoff chase. But that's like Garrett Temple, um, you know, is well respected around the league as a person, and he played in Washington with both of Bradley Beal and John Wall. And you wonder, can you bring somebody in like that? You're not going to move the needle player wise, you know. I don't think anybody of consequence is dying to get there as well as, you know, they can't trade their way in. Um, you know, the, the Wizards are going to have a real hard time finding a player that moves the needle. Um, right. they, they don't have anything to trade. So you got to look small here. And so can somebody in a veteran, you know, presence come into that locker room and sort of take charge and and get really what it is is John Wall has to either, if he's not healthy, he needs to sit. You know, that's unfortunate. If it's something else, then that's something else, whether that's, you know, upstairs in the effort department, if he is truly out there partying too much, you know, then that has to be addressed. But the fact that, like, I was willing to bet my house when he sat in their last game that they would win against the spread, and they ended up winning the game, and I forget who it was against, by, like, 25 points. And, I mean... You just knew that the minute he was off the floor, everybody was going to say, well, you know what? We can win without this guy. You know, let's show him. Yeah. And they did. And if they come out tonight, who are they playing tonight? The Wiz are playing the Pacers. If they come out tonight in Indiana yeah, against, against a good Pacers team and they keep it within five, yeah. I mean, I I need to get my bookie on the phone. And and try to put some money on this because I'm tired of my good ideas going to waste. Cause um, the you'll you'll get a good sense of, of what could I mean. I think you could you could bench Wall and let Tom, Tomas Sanaransky you know get his minutes. He, he's he's a good playmaker, and they could just go with the less is more theory. And then you bring in a veteran, you know, to sort of talk Wall off the ledge and talk these other guys into wanting to play with him again. That's the only thing I can think of, Cause. I'm out of ideas yeah. for the Washington yeah. Wizards. 
Yeah, they're, they're a mess. I, I don't, um... And I, the whole thing of, yeah, the, I've heard those rumors about him um, maybe enjoying life a little too much. Um, and that's a whole other issue. It, if, it's if that, okay if, if you're a podcaster, but not as an NBA point guard. Not, yeah, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, if that's, if that's, um, if that truly is a part of the equation, then they're even in a, I mean, that, now I don't know. Ugh. And that, that's something that, Everybody's know you know if if that's true the whole league knows it you know that's not that's not well, something and that's you- the problem I think the whole league does know it and you know it's he's now in the trap he can't get out of it you're playing poorly everybody knows that everybody else is partying as well the NBA is a drinkers league right. man somebody's right. gonna turn the the page back on that and it's gonna be a great story for you know somebody who, who one of the writers that listens to this show all the way to the 106 mark you know here's a story <laughs> for you I don't got time to write it but Oof. it's about the league drinking and yeah because everybody's out there and that was the basis of his defense early in the preseason is basically like I'm a man I can do what I want ie hey I'm not the only guy out here doing this right get off my back. You're not doing it with the star that's, you know, whatever. And so it'll be a tough road to hoe for the Washington Wizards. Um, but these dumpster fires, you know, I think we did a good job helping these teams out. We told them how stupid they were. And um, in the case of the ones that are still playoff relevant, that they need to get better, as we said it from our couches right. out here in California as we close the show uh, thank you to hawaiian isles kona coffee for the coffee that powered me through this show i couldn't be more thankful um you know they're out on their twitter account promoting hoop ball tweets which is where you can find the cosm brew show and we're very grateful for having them on board as a flagship sponsor of everything we do here at hoop ball and at the cosm brew show so uh for magoshi chinyani I'm Aaron Brewski. I'm not going to read off the Facebook and the Twitter stuff because screw y'all. You don't tweet at us anyway. And and we don't tweet at you. And another (laughs) one's in the books. Peace. Peace.